countries that were independent and prosperous, cultivating the arts and the sciences, enjoying the blessing of peace. To take sides with the combatants and to act secretly in concert with your brother Jesuit, who might be engaged on the other side, but openly opposed to that with which you might be connected. Only that the church might be the gainer in the end and the condition fixed in the treaties for peace and that the end justifies the means. You have been taught your duties as a spy to gather all statistics, facts, and information in your power from every source. To ingratiate yourself into the confidence of the family circle of the Protestants and heretics of every class and character as well as that of the merchant, the banker, the lawyer, among the schools and universities, in parliaments and legislatures and in the judiciaries and councils of state and to be all things to all men for the Pope's sake, whose servants we are unto death. You have received all your instructions heretofore as a novice, a neophyte, and have served as a coadjutor, confessor, and priest. But you have not yet been invested with all that is necessary to command in the army of Loyola in the service of the Pope. You must serve the proper time as the instrument and executioner, as directed by your superiors. For none can command here who has not consecrated his labor with the, with the blood of the heretic. For without the shedding of blood, no man can be saved. Therefore, to fit yourself for your work and make your own salvation sure, you will, in addition to your former oath of obedience to your order and allegiance to the Pope, repeat after me. I promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war secretly or openly against all heretics, Protestants, liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, condition, and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate forever their execrable race, that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisoned cup, the strangulating cord, the steel of the pinyard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever they may, may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed so to do by any agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith, the Society of Jesus. Could they carry out these kinds of monstrous oaths? They can because of the secret of the exercises. In Bomer's book on the Jesuits, we read, we imbue into him spiritual forces which he would find very difficult to eliminate later. These forces can come up again to the surface. Sometimes after years of not even mentioning them and become so imperative that the will finds itself unable to oppose any obstacle and has to follow the irresistible impulse. Folks, you know what this is? It's possession. An army of possessed men dedicated to the destruction of all governments and religion in this world. We are told in the fiery Jesuits that at that time, 1667, secular persons of both sexes joined to the company by a resignation of themselves absolutely to the conduct of the professed fathers. These usually are gentlemen and merchants who enmix themselves in the court and city business and in offices, bargains and sales, or active gentlewomen and rich widows who, like a plantation of Indies, bring into the society a vault of revenue of gold and silver. Folks, even today, these societies joined to the Jesuits exist. This is the society of the Knights of Columbus. There is a women's side to that as well. And in this publication in 1950s in Life magazine, we see that the society is alive and powerful today. Now this is the oath that the Knights of Columbus take. Again, this is from the congressional record. It's on file. In, from February 15, 1913. And here it says, and I'm quoting from it, not all of it, here we don't have time. I will place Catholic girls in Protestant families that a weekly report may be made of the inner movements of the heretics, that I will provide myself with arms and ammunition that I may be in readiness when the word is passed or am commanded to defend the church either as an individual or with a militia of the Pope. This is in 1950s, folks, or 1913. In testimony hereof, I take this holy and blessed sacrament of the Eucharist and witness the same further with my name written with the point of this dagger dipped in my own blood and sealed in the face of this holy sacrament. I do further promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, 
make and wage relentless war secretly and openly against all heretics, Protestants, and Masons, as I am directed to do, to extirpate them from the face of the earth, and that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, and that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, bury alive these infamous heretics. Open up the stomachs and wombs of their women and crush the infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate their execrable race. Same as the Jesuit folks. That when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisonous cup, the strangulation cord, the steel of the pinyard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private. Should I prove false or weaken in my determination, may my brethren and fellow militia of the Pope cut off my hands and feet, cut my throat from ear to ear, May my belly be opened and sulfur burned therein with all the punishments that can be inflicted upon me on earth and my, my soul and my soul shall be tormented by demons in eternal hell forever. That I will in voting always vote for a Knight of Columbus in preference to a Protestant, especially a Mason. In the book Catholic Power today we read that at this time, now in the 1970s, uh, and eighties, the Catholic Church now has adopted simultaneously with carrying on the old traditional religious organization, a strategy of gradualness directed at the smooth identification of more, her most advanced weapons of penetration. Hence the creation of a peculiarly suited religious, semi-religious and even lay bodies whose aim is to infiltrate the various strata of society. The last few decades have seen the multiplication of such movements of penetration labeled secular institutes. Their members generally are people who, although laymen, have the same fervor and determination to fight for the church as have the traditional religious orders. Thus, while taking the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, they do not wear special clothes, have ordinary jobs, and mainly live at home. They avoid the spotlight and keep their membership a secret, not only from their own offices or factories, their co-workers and friends, but even from their own families. This termite-like secret army is a vast international, the growth of these semi-lay and lay orders whose members are unrecognizable even to Catholics themselves in these last day, in these last few decades has been phenomenal, particularly in Protestant England and the United States. Catholic Power Today, Arrow of Manhattan, page 33. That's a book to get and study, folks. In 1773, the Jesuit order, due to the pressure of the governments of Europe, was put out of existence by the Pope. That Pope was poisoned because of that act. But the Jesuit order now no longer existed at that time. And so the Jesuits had to secularize themselves. Except in Russia, they continued unabated and controlled the government there. But Ingolstadt University had been a Jesuit center and institution for many, many years. Here in this institution, a young man, Adam Weishaupt, was a Jesuit trained doctor of canon law. Now, he wanted to see the Jesuit order come back to power. And in time, he published a plan to take that organization and give them the world. This plan is laid out in a book called Proofs of Conspiracy by John Robeson in 1798, as well as many other books. Weishaupt had long been scheming the establishment of an association or order which in time should govern the world. In his first fervor and high expectations, he hinted to several ex-Jesuits the probability of their recovering under a new name the influence which they formerly possessed and of being again of great service to society by directing the education of youth of distinction now emancipated from all civil and religious prejudices. The order, he claimed, Weis Weishaupt claims in this book, the head of the order is Jesus of Nazareth, the grand master of our order. He appeared at a time when the world was in utmost disorder and among a people who for ages had groaned under the yoke of bondage. He taught them the lessons of reason. To be more effective, he took in the aid of religion, of opinions were, which were current. And in a very clever manner, he combined his secret doctrines with the popular religion and with the customs which lay to his hand, he concealed the precious meaning and consequences of his doctrine, but fully disclosed them to a chosen few. He's teaching that Christ was a master of the secret societies, that Jesus was the author of the system of communism and universal utopia. He claims this system 
would place men in a state of liberty and moral equality, that his new system would free them from the obstacles of subordination, rank, riches, continually thrown in their way, that all governments and religions would be destroyed. Our secret association works in a way that nothing can withstand, and man shall soon be free. Proofs of Conspiracy, page 64. It was Weishaupt who designed this pyramid structure as a symbol of how he would accomplish his goal. In the book Pawns and the Games by the, uh, um, the Canadian commander, William Guy Carr, we see that the symbol that Adam Weishaupt designed was an altarpiece there in Ingolstadt University. In the book, we read, the significance of the design is as follows. The pyramid represents a conspiracy for the destruction of the Catholic Church, an establishment of the one world or UN dictatorship, the secret of the order of the eye radiated in all directions is the all-spying eye that symbolizes the terroristic Gestapo-like espionage agency that Weishaupt set up under the name of the insinuating brethren to guard the secret of the order and to terrorize the populace into acceptance of its rule. This Agpu had its first workout in the reign of terror of the French Revolution which it, which it was instrumental in organizing. Pawns in the Game by Guy Carr. What does Ellen White say about the power that took over the government of France? She says in Great Controversy, page 273, The beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. She says the atheistical power that ruled in France during the French Revolution and the reign of terror did wage such a war against God and His Holy Word as the world had never witnessed. They were the Jacobins and Weishaupt was called the father of Jacobinism. So this new satanic power that rose up in the heart of the Jesuit order now became a power warring against the Word of God to destroy all religions. In the book Pawns in the Game we read, it should be noted that this insignia acquired Masonic significance only after the merger of that order with the Order of the Illuminati, Weishaupt's organization, in the Congress of Wilhelmsbad in 1782. So Masonry has been infiltrated by uh, the Illuminati. The picture of the eye in the pyramid can be found on books fomenting the ideas of Weishaupt which caused the French Revolution and what a horrible revolution it was. Ellen White says it prefigures an event to take place in this entire world. Human beings were slaughtered mercilessly at that time as God's spirit was withdrawn. The first power to suffer was the church and the heads of state. This was Louis XVI trying to flee the country and Marie Antoinette destroyed. When Jim and I went into East Berlin, we visited a museum there on communism. And there we found that one of their main displays in the history of communism was a display on the French Revolution as part of the origin of the communist movement in this world. In fact, the term communism comes from the French word commune, where this thing originated. In time, a man by the name of Lemney and then this man, Mazzini, became a leader in the world revolution but not fully inducted into the secret orders. And he says, it says, research dug up letters from Mazzini which revealed how the high priests of the Luciferian creed keep their identity and true purpose secret. In a letter Mazzini wrote to his revolutionary associate, Dr. Bridenstine, only a few years before he died, he said, we form an association of brothers in all parts of the globe. We wish to break every yoke. Yet there is one unseen that can be hardly felt. Yet it weighs on us. Whence comes it? Where is it? No one knows. Or at least no one tells. This association is secret, even to us, the veterans of the secret society. Even to those involved in leading out in world revolutions, it was a secret society controlling them behind the scenes. This man took over after Mazzini.